Let's go to our, our Bible lesson time. Open your Bibles again to the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, if you will, please. Hebrews, chapter 10. Hebrews 10. And we've gone as far as uh, verse 22 thus far. Um, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of the faith, of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Now just because the words sprinkled and water show up in the verse, it has no reference to water baptism by sprinkling, as it's practiced by Lutherans and Roman Catholics and Episcopalians and uh, some United Methodists and perhaps other groups. But it has to do with the conscience being purified by faith. Go forward just a, a few pages to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter 3, and notice there verse 21. Notice what Peter says, verse 21. This verse is always twisted around by people to try to prove water baptism saves a soul. It does not. But notice what the language says in verse 21. The like figure, so it's it's something is a symbol of something else. The like figure, whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, parentheses, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. That's the purpose of water baptism. Mm -hmm. The answer of a good conscience is a testimony by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then back in our text, verse 22, the body is washed only in, only in the sense that the body becomes the temple of the Holy Ghost, which now belongs to God, and um, uh, from which all filth and filthiness are to be cleansed. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1 says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And then now, verse 23 says, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, and so forth. That is to hold something tight so you don't lose it, so you can't let go of it. And this is like the wording we read back in chapter 3, if you want to look back there. Chapter 3 and verse 6. But Christ, as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. And also chapter 3, verse 14. For we are made partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. And we discuss those verses as Tribulation, tribulation passages, not church age passages. Uh, the writer is about to discuss one of the most treacherous subjects found anywhere in the book of Hebrews. In the next few verses, verses 26 through 31, which gives a lot of modern day preachers and Bible critics uh, trouble and difficulty. But um, before that, there's a there's some good devotional material to be gleaned from verses 23, 24, and 25. Let's read those verses again. Let us hold fast the profession of our hope without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as you see the day approaching. It's good to meet together, physically, with other Christians. It's good to read the Bible together mm. with other Christians. It's good to pray mm. together with other Christians. It's good to try and escape the corruptions of the, the world outside with other Christians. Yes. You're knit together by the same saving grace of Jesus Christ, and you've been washed clean by the, same, by the faith in the same blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, why wouldn't you want to be in proximity with other Christians of like mind and like faith who have the same Bible, they're trusting the same grace, they've been born again by the same Savior, they have the same hope, 
they're heading for the same place. You're going to spend eternity with them anyway. Might as well become friends with them now. And uh, ask God to knit you together in fellowship and friendship with each other. But um, you want to escape the pollutions of this world with others, if at all possible. The Bible says, uh, Galatians 6, verse 2, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. You can't do that by remote control. You can't do that very easily or very effectively just watching internet sermons or watching television ministers. You can't do that only by hearing radio sermons or reading magazine articles. You need to be with other Christians. Amen. They need your fellowship. You need theirs. That's the way God has so constituted us that we, if we, he binds us together by faith, doesn't it stand to reason he wants us to associate with each other and be together with each other whenever we can and um, the old way of doing things um, Sunday morning Sunday night Wednesday night or three times a week those three times a week are not enough to sustain a Christian any longer the world has gotten so rotten the last 45 50 years you need to augment those meetings with those other things but don't make those other things take the place of meeting with other believers, if at all possible. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. The day is going to be the return of Jesus Christ, the second advent of Jesus Christ, and it's still approaching from our perspective. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. Um, like 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see yes. him as he is. Yes. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he, Christ, is pure. So you're looking forward to seeing him face to face, but until that moment comes, until that hour uh, comes, you're to be uh, drawn as close to him as possible uh, with other believers as possible for the same purpose and to affect the same uh, blessing in the world. Um, these are church age reminders in a tribulation text. You might write it down that way. And the context switches back and forth from the church age to the tribulation a number of times in these so-called general epistles from Hebrews to the book of Revelation. If you try to make it all apply to the church age today, then you're running into all these contradictions. Well, Paul says over here, we're sealed by the Holy Spirit on the day of redemption. We're, we're secure. But over here, it sounds like you can lose it. That's because you haven't rightly divided the word of truth and realized there's a distinction between the church age in which we live now, um, in which a person can be born again and saved for sure, for certain, and forever, yes. without any effort on his part, except by trusting what Jesus did for him. And sometime in the future, when James says uh, faith without that, that faith and works are necessary, faith without works is dead, where the Apostle Paul says, by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, right. lest any man should boast. So which is it? The answer is yes. You're living here. You're not living over there. So you have to draw a clear distinction between the day and age we live in now and the conditions under which someone will find themselves after the rapture, after the catching away of the Christians, and those left behind who weren't believers are now going to have to turn to Jesus Christ and avoid the mark of the beast and resist the Antichrist and help the Jew and aid the Jew in his time of persecution. A lot of pressure and even then you have to hold out to the end until Christ comes back without succumbing to those pressures in order to be saved and like I said in the church hour I'm saved now I'm not waiting to, to successfully pass a future test I'm saved now you know the day and age you and I live in right now is the simplest most blessed easy time yes. for a sinner to be born again that's ever existed <clears throat> in the history of the world and uh, it's a shame that people can't see the divisions in the Bible and the distinctions and understand how 
easy it should be for them to be saved and to receive the grace of God and be, be certain that if they died right now, they'd wake up in heaven with Jesus Christ. But um, it's the job of the devil. Um, 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, The God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. So it's the job of the devil to go about trying to fool people, make them think there's something they have to do to earn it, to justify it, to, to justify themselves, to qualify themselves for it. And the truth is, there's nothing you, you need to do, and there's nothing you can do. Now, the Calvinists will say, believing the gospel, that's like works. You're doing something. That's not, that's, that doesn't constitute works, it constitutes obedience. Which is completely different. Excuse me, just for a moment. Let's go to um, verses 26 through 31. <clears throat> For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy, under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite under the Spirit of grace? For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord, and again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. <clears throat> Critics go to great lengths to stumble over themselves, trying to reconcile this passage with the promises to church-age believers, eternal security, <clears throat> justification by faith, uh, and so forth. And they usually fall down and aren't sure how to pick themselves up again. But uh, you get language like these in many of the modern day commentaries. Quote, the grammatical forms are very significant in this passage, etc. Who cares? Uh, quote, the reference is to one who willfully sins habitually because the Greek verb is the present participle, etc. Uh, quote, sanctification was not actual, but only positional, whatever that means, as part of the larger professing uh, body of Christ. I have no idea what that author is trying to say. Thank you. Anything but believe the simple uh, definition, the simple language of the authorized version, and its obvious implications. He's talking about somebody uh, who's living under conditions that are not straightforward and simple, and there is no eternal security promised to somebody by grace through faith plus nothing. But the verses are aimed at tribulation Jews. After the rapture, under the reign of an antichrist, which is evident from an Old Testament passages being cited down there in verses um, uh, verse 30. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. That's from Deuteronomy 32, verses 35 and 36. And the word we, for if we sin willfully after that we have received, etc., identifies a Hebrew who is writing to other Hebrews in the book of Hebrews. The fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries, verse 27. That's a direct reference to a few verses. Let me have you go back to Zechariah. Zechariah uh, chapter 1. Zechariah 
Zechariah chapter 1. <clears throat> I'm sorry. I think I want to make it <clears throat> Zephaniah. I think I gave the wrong book. It's two pages over. It's two whole pages. Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 18. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath, but the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy. For he shall make even a, a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. Also go to Malachi, last book in the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 4. Let's read verses 1 to 3. Malachi 4, verses 1 through 3. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that, uh, that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, Ooh. saith the Lord of hosts. And go forward to the New Testament to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians and chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians 1, verses um, 8 and 9. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Well, that's going to be the second advent, the return of Jesus Christ to judge the Antichrist and the wicked of the world who worship the Antichrist. That's the second advent. Therefore, period just preceding it has to be a tribulation reference. Uh, Moses and his rules of two or three witnesses uh, are also invoked in this section of the Bible. And uh, verse 28, by the way, you don't need to turn, but that rule, two or three witnesses, Starts back in the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 36, verse 30. And the doctrine of two or three witnesses is given throughout the scriptures, Old Testament and New Testament. And it's given uh, eight times in the Bible. Numbers 35, verse 30, Deuteronomy 17, verse 6, Deuteronomy 19, verse 15, Matthew 18, verse 16, Jesus invoked it, John 8, verse 17, and uh, also 2 Timothy 2, 15, or um, that's 2 I mean, Timothy, I'm sorry, 1 Timothy 5, Verse 19. You know, God also gave Pharaoh two different versions of the same dream in Joseph's day to confirm it to be so. And, and my point in pointing that out is that if someone proposes an idea that they say, this is scriptural, this is a biblical teaching or a biblical doctrine, then you have to uh, expect them to give you two, or better yet, three clear references on the subject from the Bible to confirm whether it's so or not. If they only give you one verse and say, this is what the rest of the Bible means, take it with a ton of salt. Because they're probably lying to you. And one of the greatest examples is Matthew um, 16, verse 18. Thou, and I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's the verse the Catholic Church says uh, Jesus was making, where Jesus was making Simon Peter his 
uh, the leader of his future church, the, effectively the first pope. Matthew 16, verse 18. Well, we need to ask them to give us at least two more sound verses to confirm that idea. If they can't, and they can't, then maybe they're wrong. And yeah, they are. <laughs> That's still being debated by Catholics and Protestants today, 2019. Uh, if it was so, it would be cut and dried, and there'd be no <clears throat> wiggle room for anyone to, to, to debate it, to doubt it, to question it, to argue against it. But it's... It's still being debated and kicked around today, uh, so it probably isn't the, the truth. Um, the the um, the idea that Christ gave Simon Peter this commission, uh, Christ's conversation with Simon Peter is also mentioned in the book of Mark and in the book of Luke, but in those two gospels, neither one mentioned anything <clears throat> about Simon Peter being elevated to the status of uh, the primary bishop of the church, or the, or the first pope. So, two other examples where, where they should have confirmed each other aren't there. So a text without its context is a pretext. By the way, in Matthew chapter 7 earlier, Jesus said, Whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him to a wise man which built his house upon a rock. Excuse me. Christ is the rock. Not Simon Peter. So you, want to, so you want to ask someone to give you two, or better yet, three clear references, clear verses on the, on the same subject that agree together before something is confirmed as a biblical doctrine, before you can go out and repeat it to someone else. And um, so bear that in mind as you go. By the way, you know, I was thinking the other day, an effective way to learn the English Bible I know it sounds self-evident, but an effective way to learn the English Bible is to have a better understanding of the English language. Mm -hmm. You want to read those verses, for example, 2 Chronicles 7.14 is a prime example. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and not until then. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their land. That's always thrown out as the patriotic verse for Americans. But there's qualifications necessary before God acts. If they do this, this, and this, then I'll respond. But until they do, he's under no obligation to respond. So when you're reading through your Bible, notice those verses oftentimes that begin with if and conclude with then. Because it shows the conditions necessary before God is obligated to respond or act in that circumstance, those circumstances. But um, so Moses uh, and his rule of two or three witnesses is invoked. Uh, verse thirty says, "The Lord shall judge His people." Well, His people in a book written to Hebrews means that His people are Hebrews. His His people are Jews in this case. Um, verse six. Couldn't be more self-evident when something's written to Jews. Don't try to force it upon church age saints. James 1, verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greeting. You can't say that's forced upon every Gentile believer in the New Testament church. So there's clearly a distinction between those things aimed at believers now and those things <clears throat> aimed primarily at those left after the rapture. And the book of Hebrews is that way. And uh, the verse, the, the text says, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, verse 31. But not if you're saved, it's not a fearful thing. That's one of the best places you can be, is in the hands of the living God. Mm. Go back, if you will, to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 33. Let's call your attention, I think, one verse there. Deuteronomy 33. Deuteronomy 33. And um, 
Notice there, verse 27. The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. And he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee, and shall say, Destroy them. Go forward to the book of John. Gospel of John, chapter 10. John chapter 10. John 10, notice there verse, um, verses 28 and 29. And I give unto them eternal, un eternal life, they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. You know, physically, Jesus couldn't have held every person in his hands. It's, it's figurative language, or rather it literally would, it's figurative language. But if you're trusting in him and his ability to secure you, to sustain you, there's no way in the world that he's going to have butterfingers and let you go. And in uh, Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 30. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. You're not only in Christ's hands, you're part of his hands. This is how closely you and I are knit to the Lord Jesus Christ by the new birth. Um, go back, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. First Corinthians 12. And... Start there at verse 18. But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it hath pleased him. And if they were all members, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body. So you and I, in a spiritual way, and a, a non-physical way, constitute the body of Jesus Christ. So you're not only held in his hands, you're part of his hands, if you're in Jesus Christ. And so to fall into the hands of a living God, that's a blessing for the child. If, the, if it applied to a church age saint, it would be a great blessing. It wouldn't be a fearful thing at all. So it has to be, belong to somebody, it has to be applied to somebody who's living in a different age, in the time of the tribulation. The tribulation is focused uh, on the future of the Jews. Go back, if you will, to Jeremiah chapter 30. Jeremiah chapter 30. Jeremiah 30, and I'm going to, at verse 7, it says, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, that he shall be saved out of it. So the tribulation is focused upon the future uh, of the Jew, first and foremost, and the Gentiles by association. I want you to notice something there in verse 6, unrelated, perhaps. Ask ye now, and see whether a man doth travail <clears throat> with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins, as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness. Joel chapter 2, verse 6, says, Before their face the people shall be much pained, 
all faces shall gather blackness. And this is what I call comparing Scripture with Scripture. I read those verses, all faces shall gather blackness, and what does that mean? Blackness. When someone's completely frightened and they're fearful, their skin doesn't turn black. Not unless they're a black person already, but that's, not, that's a totally different subject. So what does it mean? Well, the words, this is why I said a minute ago, an effective way to rightly divide the word of truth and learn the English Bible is to have a better understanding of English. The words black and bleach come from the same root. So comparing scripture with scripture, when it says all faces shall gather blackness, and over here all faces shall gather paleness, we can easily see someone who the, who the, the blood rushes out of their face. Even uh, black Americans will recognize the, the, the change in the, in the skin color of another black person when they're afraid. They can tell the distinction in the skin tone. You and I might not be able to spot it these, as easily as they can, but they do. They can recognize the difference and the tint or pinkness uh, flushes away from their skin when they're under stress or a lot of fear. And so paleness helps us understand what he meant by said blackness because they both come from the same root. Doesn't mean they're going to turn black like the color, the dark color black, but they're going to lose the color out of their faces, out of their cheeks because of fear. That does happen. And... Um, but the time of Jacob's trouble is aimed at the future of the Jew and the condition of the Jew. So this passage which we were looking at today has to do with a Jew uh, in the tribulation whose salvation is not for sure, for certain, and forever unless he um, abides to the end, uh, resists the pressure of the man of sin. He's not murdered by the Antichrist. doesn't take the mark of the beast. Somehow he survives and uh, worships the Lord God, and worships Jesus Christ. You know something? After the, after the time of the law, the Old Testament commandments, laws of Moses, where salvation uh, was conditioned upon your degree of obedience, we have the time of grace, yes. where it doesn't require you to do anything except trust what Jesus Christ did for yes. you. It stands to reason that the next period of time would be some hybrid combination of those two periods, mm -hmm. race and faith coupled together, or faith and works coupled together. How much grace? How much works? I don't know. I'm not planning to be here. Amen. <laughs> right? Yes. But it just sure seems logical a logical development in one from one dispensation, one age to another, that the next logical one would be a combination of grace uh, and works, which is exactly what we read in, in Revelation 12 and Revelation 17. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony and their works, faith and works coupled together. 